Since his beginnings in the Greek weird wave, Yorgos Lantimos has been shocking audiences. With Poor Things, Lantimos takes his brash and distinctive style to a new level. I must go punch that baby. How did Lantimos and his team build his most audacious film yet? I don't know. Exactly, that's the experiment. This is How They Shot It, Poor Things. Before we begin our journey, don't forget to subscribe to Studio Binder and enable notifications to stay up to date on all our filmmaking videos. We'll be using Studio Binder's shot list to look at some of the technical choices the filmmakers made from shot to shot. We will be spoiling elements of poor things. Ah. Now, time for our lesson. Ah. Ah. <laughs> poor Things is based on the 1992 satirical novel of the same name by Alastair Gray. The film follows the adventures of a woman who has been resurrected with the brain of her own unborn child. Fate had brought me a dead body and a live infant. It was obvious. It was? Take the infant's brain out and put it in the full-grown woman. Reanimate her and watch. The film saw Lantimos working with his biggest budget yet, $35 million. They need money. Everyone does. But more money didn't dilute Lantimos' style. It only heightened it. Pulling from visual inspirations like Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula, and refusing to use storyboards or shot lists, Lanthimos's freewheeling hyper-stylization is on full display throughout Poor Things. This stylization would not have been possible without unconventional cinematography. The cinematography of Poor Things is immediately striking. Lanthimos and director of photography Robbie Ryan conducted extensive equipment tests to pull off the unique look. It's all very interesting. They decided to shoot primarily on a 35 mm Arri ST, with occasional use of an Arricam LT as a backup. They also used a VistaVision camera from the 1950s, known for its 1661 widescreen format. But it was only used for Bella's reanimation sequence because it was too loud for dialogue scenes. While using the VistaVision camera, the camera department accidentally let the battery get too low, which caused the frame rate to drop. When played back at 24 frames per second, Bella's eyes snap open like a doll. An effect Lantimos and Ryan liked. The team shot on Kodak Vision 3 500T 5219 film stock for most of the color sequences. Though Lisbon was shot using Kodak's Ektachrome 100D 5294 stock. This is a color reversal positive film stock, creating a much more saturated and contrasty image. For the black and white footage, the crew used Eastman XX 5222 stock. For lenses, Lantimos had high expectations. Ryan explains. The process for poor things, me and Jorgis tested an awful lot of lenses. We had one day where we tested over 50 lenses, I think, 40 or 50 lenses, and like loads of different kind of varieties of optics. They eventually narrowed their lenses down to three types, portrait, wide, and zoom. For portrait lenses, Ryan and Lantimos went with 58 and 85 mm Lomography Petzvolts, which have a distinct spiraling focus falloff near the edge of the frame. They were set to their widest apertures with the 58 mm at T2.1 and the 85 mm at T2.3. For the wide angle lenses, they used an 8 mm Oppenheimer Nikkor lens as well as a 10mm T2.1 Airy Zeiss Ultra Prime. But the most abrasive wide-angle lens was the 4mm Optex Super Cine. 
because it is made for 16mm cameras, it created an extreme vignette. These wide-angle lenses allowed for freer camera movement. Bumps that occurred when the dolly was off tracks weren't registered. Just a butcher's tray for a Sunday lunch. Lanthimos also wanted a zoom lens that could go from 10 to 180 millimeters, but such a lens didn't exist. He settled for a 16.5 to 110 millimeter Airy Zeiss Master Zoom and included multiple zooms throughout the film. Lanthimos and Ryan's lighting helped ground the stylized camera equipment choices. The director wanted to have the light feel natural and realistic, often choosing to place lights outside windows on set. Ryan explains that he and Lanthimos would attempt to light each world as if it was a normal location. She's going over the side. Oh, marvelous. I never imagined being murdered. How dramatic. Well, she seems happy to die. I'm sorry for getting in your way. Lighting placement also took camera movement into account. Lanthimos often wanted to be able to move at a full 360 degrees. So Ryan would have to both hide lights and rely heavily on practicals. Lisbon required particularly extensive rigs to keep lights out of sight. Gaffers hung 24, 24K and 26, 12K Dino lights high enough to stay out of the camera's line of sight, while also using quarter Wendy lights for street scenes, as well as bouncing Aerimax 18Ks with half CTs off walls. For black and white scenes, Ryan wanted the lighting to be more contrasty, so he removed diffusion for most lights. Well, I'm not safe with you, I think. You are absolutely not. <laughs> The stylized aesthetic of Poor Things was also bolstered by its incredibly detailed production design. Nearly all of Poor Things was filmed on sound stages. As Lanthimos explains, I felt we would have to build a world which resembled her way of viewing things. That meant that we would have to build it in a studio, even the exteriors, and create this tweaked reality that was based on familiar things in a familiar period, but an alternate universe. These stages were located at Riga and Korda Studios in Hungary, and the biggest stage was 64,310 square feet. The creation of the sets was overseen by production designers Shona Heath and James Price. Because it was such an extensive endeavor, Price and Heath utilized VR on Unreal Engine to walk Lanthimos and Ryan through sets before they were built. As Ryan explains, the program allowed us to view their designs in real time and make changes as needed. Once Yorgos approved the design, it became the template for the physical sets. Thanks, madam. Heath and Price wanted each city Bella visited to have its own unique visual palette. Heath elaborates. We started with a painting for each city to give us a feeling. Lisbon was sort of dusty and magical and a bit candy sweet, while Paris was sort of cold and beautiful, like a Degas painting. The sets were built to feel as real as possible. Nearly everything was to scale and used accurate building materials. Because the camera would be moving around with an ultra-wide angle lens, sets needed to be as complete as possible. Really? Say more. Heath and Price did, however, make accommodations for sound since the studios were so echoey. Delighted. Many sets were soundproofed with a mixture of timber and concrete. CGI was also utilized when necessary. If the camera captured areas where the set ended, visual effects artists would extend the scenery in post. The cruise ship, meanwhile, was placed in a 197 by 33 foot LED virtual production volume. The team displayed animated water and bright sky plates to make the lighting on the boat feel realistic. 
Virtual production supervisor Adrian Weber also notes, the main reason they decided to shoot with virtual production and not green screen was that the ship had lots of glass and other reflective surfaces. They knew an LED volume would give them an excellent visual starting point they could extend out with additional effects as needed. The rich production design was paired with equally stunning costumes and makeup. Bella, it's dangerous to go out without me. I have adventured it and found nothing but sugar and violence. The makeup and costumes of poor things combine forward thinking modern aesthetics with familiar Victorian touchstones. Hair and makeup artist Nadia Stacy used character backgrounds to inform her process. For Bella, Stacy noted, she doesn't have any societal restraint. She wouldn't know that women tie their hair up and she shouldn't have it loose like that. Stacy was instructed from the beginning that wigs were to be avoided. So she instead uses extensions to elongate Emma Stone's hair, which at some points in the film got up to 42 inches. I seek employment at your musty smelling establishment of good time fornication. A woman plotting her course to freedom. Happy lot, Lanthimos and Stacy decided to avoid putting any makeup on Emma Stone for nearly the entire movie, except for when Bella is working in the brothel. For these scenes, Stacy explained, it's done kind of naively. Everything's done with very basic materials. Godwin, however, required a much more hands-on approach. Stacy took a picture of Willem Dafoe's face and cut it up reassembling it to get a general idea of how she wanted it to look. Let us find a body. She then worked with prosthetic designer Marc Coulier, who made 3D scans and moulds of Defoe's face. He then sculpted the necessary pieces with the help of concept artists. The final prosthetics took three hours to apply each day. Costume designer Holly Waddington, meanwhile, created eye-popping outfits. Lanthimos describes his and Waddington's approach to costuming. This was not going to be a very traditional period film, so we could work with layers of garments that we would never normally see in films. Waddington explains how she wanted to highlight Bella's childish nature through her costumes. Just looking at my own kids and also observing how children often are half-dressed. I'd seen this before I had my own children. And you get them dressed in the morning and very quickly they shed their clothes or they end up with like bits missing and often it's the, from the waist down that's missing. Yes! <laughs> Waddington avoided ever putting women in restrictive corsets. Instead, emulating Victorian fashion through massive sleeves. She notes that big sleeves felt quite empowering and were like lungs full of breath and air that ignited and reanimated Bella. I also wish to dash his body, form cadaver into the sea. In an act of gender subversion, Waddington put Duncan in more restrictive costuming. As Mark Ruffalo explains, I had thigh pads, I had calf pads, I had a codpiece, I had a corset. I had the high collar. It makes him a bit of a rooster. At the risk of being immodest, you've just been thrice f***ed by the very best. It's probable no other man will ever bring you to the raptures I have. I feel bad for you. Taken all together, the costumes and makeup departments helped define the characters and themes that made poor things click. She is a being of free will. Poor Things is unlike most other films. It sees Lanthimos pushing his style to its furthest extremes with innovative approaches to cinematography, production design, and costumes and makeup. Poor Things doesn't happen without planning. Godwin has told me your plan. Get started on your own satire with Studio Binder screenwriting and storyboard software. That's all for now. See you next time. I'm rested. Let us go again. Again? Unfortunately, even I have my limits. Men cannot keep coming back for more. It is a physiological problem? A weakness in men? Mm, well... Perhaps so.